Hello. Hi. Hi. This is the 716 Sports Podcast. I am Justin. I am Bill. That's Bill. Hey. And across the way here, we have Scott Escobar. He has a last name. Uh, he's part of the Top Shelf Hockey Podcast, or Top Shelf from Mama Hides, the podcast. Perfect. Hey, how's it going? Where do you find your podcast? You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or we have a website. The website is just tshockeypodcast.com. And what makes this podcast great is level of commitment to this podcast. They're all about it. Three guys. Three guys, right? Yep, three, three guys. And they watch every game together and record a show for just about every game. Yeah, right, right after. Almost every single game. I think we've missed maybe four on the season now. Um, it, it's just fun to do, you know, two buddies drinking some, some beers and watching the game. I'm looking at the website right now. And like you said, tshockeypodcast.com. And, uh, yeah, just about every game from the season, a uh, couple here and there missed, but for the most part, basically a recap of, uh, of every single contest this They're season. Very informative, are- too. Beloved home team has played part of the uh, part of the seven one six sports network that's had a brief hiatus, but we'll be back next this upcoming Monday. We we'll be back. Put it, put it in ink. I'll write it down. <laughs> we'll be back. Nah, that's fine. We we'll back. Thanks for joining us tonight, Scott. So you can tell nobody else is here because it's my pleasure. Real life for individuals. Uh, Jeff is doing trivia somewhere. Yeah, gotta get paid. Jeff just likes hearing his own voice, I think. It just never stops talking between... I, I don't know what you're talking about. ...the show, our broadcasting, <laughs> the trivia. It's nice around the house. I live with Jeff, for those of you who Full disclosure. Don't know. <laughs> but uh, he doesn't do much talking at home, so I, I think it's because he does so much talking outside of it, so... Oh, there's a couple Not jokes there, but we won't make them. <laughs> and uh, Michael is traveling for work. Mike's back, but Mike said uh, he want to come tonight. He was tired. Well, yeah. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Long day in a row. He was traveling, though. He was traveling. Was he on plane or car or horse? Or he was what? on four wheels. Okay. It's big, man. Yeah. Long day. Sure. Long day in the road. He had to the eat out-of-town out food. <clears throat> yeah, so the Sabres had a pretty uh, nice nice three-game stretch there. Three games in four nights. Sounds like TNT NBA playoff coverage. But, yeah, it was uh, quite the little treat for uh, the, the downtown folk here. Uh, all home games, all against Western Conference foes, and a pretty successful. They draw four out of six points on it, where if you asked me for my ideal total, I think I would have said four. Three would have been acceptable. Two would have been a complete disaster. So because they were able to play a hideous game but defeated Colorado, and then I think played, you can make an argument, their best game of the season against St. Louis on Saturday afternoon. The Chicago game, when you, you roll in on sun, on Sunday, you're basically playing for bonus points at that point against a team that clearly improved to be more talented. But really was impressed with the performance that they had on, on Saturday. And now they go into this bye week with you know four points in hand that they didn't have before. And now... Everybody gets to catch up to them in terms of games played before they embark on the easiest West Coast swing of all time against Colorado and Arizona. They're catching a lot of flack after this Chicago loss. You know, they lost pretty bad 5-1. to But I don't think it's so much on the team as it has to do with the fact that they faced Chicago at the last game on the end of an 11-game to 19-day streak, which is not a very fun light at the end of the tunnel. (laughs) No. I don't care who you are. Chicago is still, the, you know, one of, if not the standard bear in the NHL. Technically, they're, you know, they're not even leading their division right now. Uh, anybody that wants to bet against them in the Western Conference playoffs, go right ahead. Feel free. Uh, no reason to think that they won't be a, a player uh, come playoff time. You know, as long as they can survive what seemingly is now their annual bloodbath against St. Louis in the divisional realm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, they came in here and did what Chicago does. They are a high powered offensive team and they were able to suppress the Buffalo scoring attack enough to walk away with a dominant victory. That's not even to mention it was their second game back, I think, from their bye week. Teams yes, aren't that successful on their first game back, but they're picking right. They're, they picked up their second game in Chicago. Like you said, is Chicago. They're just 
they hold the puck so well in the offensive zone. It's so fun to watch. They're put, like Panera and Kane just control the puck in the offensive zone. It, it's so fun to watch as a hockey fan. Yeah, and as you said, they were. It was a weird thing where they were home against Edmonton and then traveling to Buffalo. Not exactly a short road trip on a back to back, but they were able to hold together. The Edmonton game that they played out of the bye week on Saturday was actually their first loss in the month of February. So a team that has been consistently putting up four or five goals in just about every game recently, and they did it again, winning 5-1. to one. We can dwell on that. It's obviously the most recent game, but I think first let's talk about what we saw on Thursday and then let's talk about what we saw on Saturday because the Chicago loss, while disappointing, there were some really good things that I think we saw on both Thursday and Saturday. Thursday, a little bit tougher to pick out the good things. Um, but to me, anytime you can get a shutout, that's a good thing. I don't care. This is not a team that shuts people out ever, <laughs> right? They always seem to let in at least one goal. And I think people that still are Robin Leonard critics, they're critics because they don't like the one or two goals that he gives up because sometimes they feel like they're a little bit soft. They're from a fluky angle. There's something not natural about the way that the goal goes in, right? Against the worst team in the NHL, the Sabres did exactly what they were supposed to do, and they shut out the worst offense in the NHL and came away with a 2 nothing victory. Building blocks, but, hey, it was something. I think that's that's a perfect description of the game. I was actually at the game. It was my first game of the season. I was five rows from the bench, and it's not the, the best angle to watch some hockey being played, but it was really interesting to see the players interact with each other on the bench. But uh, like you said, the Sabres did what they had to do. It wasn't pretty at times, but they got the job done. I mean, you described it perfectly. Well, and, you know, that Avalanche team is about as bad as any of the tankier Sabres teams. They are slow. They cannot hold possession. Their passing is whatever the opposite of crisp is. I mean, they have a ton of turnovers and never seem to connect with each other in the offensive end on these passes. They, they just, the, the puck does not stick to them. And you, you know, it, it, it's a real struggle for them. And, and we saw that. Now, it, it wasn't the world's most impressive performance, but. It's a 23-save shutout for Robin Leonard, who, for whatever reason, still seems to have a lot of negative things going against him. The Sabres also played a really disciplined game, didn't take a penalty. May have been a little bit of some home calls in that case, but you have to be pleased with what you saw overall because those are the type of performances that build confidence for teams. They they know that they can, you know, they're all still NHL players, so anytime you can shut out an, off, an offense, there's something to be said. And then, of course, in the third period, it was a pretty sleepy game, but Evander Kane showing off how he's become the best offensive player on this team with a fantastic cut in the offensive zone right to the center, easily defeating uh, the goalie. And it was a Pickard, I believe, was in there. And and that was it. That, that sealed the 2 nothing victory. Kane's interesting to talk about. Cause like, he is, <clears throat> and I think we need to discuss him a little bit more here because... He was a candidate for a variety of reasons that we don't need to necessarily rehash right Mm -hmm. now, was when we were doing over the summer our series on who the Sabres should keep and who they should expose in this expansion draft, I think we all kind of came to the consensus that Evander Kane had to go. And look, we're just like everybody else. We're morality police when things aren't going well, and then you see what comes and happens on the ice, and... This is the longest that he's kept his nose clean since he's come to Buffalo. There's been no incidents since the alleged uh, assaults that occurred, both of the sexual and the physical variety, last season and over the summer. And now, this guy that we saw a couple months ago walking into court downtown is the most important offensive player on the team, like it or not. He is the most talented player currently on the Sabres. This is one of the more in one of the most intriguing uh, talking points I, I've ever I think witnessed as a Sabres fan. Just if we should trade him, if we shouldn't trade him. I've been back and forth on it myself. 
But you're right. He's having a hell of a run here offensively. Um, the goals are just going in the net. And from any angle, he's shooting, of course, because that's what he does. But they're just going in now, and it, it, it's looking good for him. So that's tough, though. So, like, they're in the playoff race now. You don't want to trade your best goal scorer when you're trying to sneak into the playoffs. So, like, do you, you – but he's so hot right now. You can literally, you know, I would say maximize your assets, you know, your output, I mean. Yeah. It, so do you make, take the risk you make the trade now, or then let him finish the season, and think about trading him then? Because it seems kind of more like a off season draft day type trade. Because the, 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 the thing you, got, you really got to think about is, can you afford to pay him, O'Reilly, Eichel, Reinhardt, and yeah. and, <clears throat> and that's the thing. And when we're talking about how hot he's been um, in his last six games. Uh, or sorry, last seven games, seven goals and one assist, um, two against San Jose, two against Toronto, and then one each in these three games that we're discussing against Colorado, St. Louis, and Chicago. He takes a ton of shots. He leads the team in shots taken. Of course, that's who he is. He's a volume shooter when it comes to on the ice. For whatever reason, this is, you know, when you talk about streaky guys, this is one of the hottest this is the best streak he's been on since he's come to Buffalo from Winnipeg and he's the type of wing that when he gets on one of these streaks it feels like he's going to keep shooting and he he just keeps building on it because he has the confidence and he seems to know how he's controlling the puck and don't forget he was hurt at the beginning of the season he didn't score his first goal of the season until December so this is, especially in, when you look at that condensed schedule of about, really, it's only about 40 games or so that he's logged on the season. Um, it, it, there's no denying the talent. It's whether or not you want to deal with an individual that has shown questionable judgment in the past, reckless judgment, really, besides the arrest. There was the incident for the All-Star game when he drove up to the NBA All-Star game and slept in and was basically stuck in Toronto. Um, what do, what do you value and what do you want to do? Do you want to deal with the potential headache? Like you said, there are cap implications here as well. And then you're talking about, like I said, the most productive forward on the, and he has really been the most productive forward on the ice, basically for the Sabres since the all-star break. So do you trade him in the off season and you know, you still get a great return for him. <clears throat> or do you, you know, play your hand, keep him for the next season, and see how he, see how he plays out, and try to re-sign him? Because you figure what he's had to go through in Atlanta and Winnipeg, he he claims he wasn't really wanted there, and now he's a, he's had a team where they've stuck by him thoroughly through two instances. And yeah, because do, I don't do think, think yeah. do you think he owes them? Any kind of a hometown discount? No, for nobody that. owes anything. So he, I, he made a he, he got this big contract. Yeah, but right I, off his thirty goal season. I know. You think he's got to think he earns another deserves another six million dollars? <clears throat> yes. No player should ever, and okay. that's a blanket thing for me. No player should ever take a discount because all the owners are just trying to chip away from whatever the players can earn. That's so, I, so I no, I understand and I appreciate. And I there is an argument to be made. Well, like you said, they've stuck by this guy they've dealt with a lot of headaches and a lot of bad press from him and his actions that ultimately hurt the team and the franchise i still think i expose him in the expansion draft see where things fall and then maybe discuss trading him in the off season but it's a lot it's a lot more of a difficult situation now given what the production is and it all depends on what kind of return. Uh, you know, what what would your expectations be for a return on this guy right now? I would think at least a first round pick, a productive NHL player, and a prospect at a minimum. And if you're not going to get that, like he seems like the type of guy that would be. I don't even know because when you talk about like what kind of culture fit is he for certain teams? Because a lot of teams don't want to deal with the headaches of 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 who he is at this point. I mean, it's just. He has a reputation. It's an earned reputation as being a malcontent, essentially. Not only the instances off the ice, but his teammates 
threw his stuff into the shower. His teammates couldn't get wait to, wait to get rid of him in Winnipeg, right? People did not like him. They didn't like him as a teammate. So it takes a unique situation for him to walk into. I don't think that he's a guy that you pick up mid-season because he may not immediately mesh with people, and then that's a real issue. I, I think that's a great point. Um, I've been on the I've been back and forth on the fence with this guy. Um, I think if you made a good point, maybe it, it makes more sense for a, a trade around the draft. But in my opinion, if there's a deal there for a top three, four defenseman right now, I would do it. Um, the Sabers' biggest weakness is their defense, um, so we need to shore that up somehow. I don't think we can give him another contract. I think he'll be looking at six, maybe seven million even. And you figure we have to pay Eichel, Reinhardt, um, we, probably another defenseman too. We're going to get a defenseman some, from somewhere. We need to. And you also have Laner coming up this season. I'm not sure how much we're going to give him, but with the way he's been playing, um, I'm, I'm sort of worried uh, that Murray might give him a, a decent size contract here. And I wouldn't do that for Lena right now, but we'll see what happens. But that's where I land right now, but I've been back and forth this whole season on him, so we'll see where it goes from here. There's not a ton of defensemen that are really intriguing at at this deadline. Um, do you want – this is not the <clears throat> this is not the team that should go out and try and get a Kevin Shattenkirk because he you already know that he's not going to stay next season you think so i he's already kind of indicated that the teams that he's interested in are east coast and he's mentioned toronto and he's mentioned montreal but yeah buffalo is not listed when it comes to that so you know we we tried it before acquiring the rights to a guy and convincing him to stay and it not working and you know that's why apparently we're just going to boo peter vesey every time he touches the puck for the rest of his life (laughs) in buffalo but we never even had the guy but point being if that's how we're going to respond to that, I'm very curious to see how they would do with a Shattenkirk who realistically I think would rather, if he is going to be moved, wants to go to a cup contender. And if you're St. Louis, you have to trade him to the Eastern Conference because you don't want to be end up facing this guy potentially in the playoffs. I'd still give my shot at him, but um, there's actually another defenseman I've been looking at very heavily on the free agent uh, list in the upcoming season. Um, he doesn't get a lot of credit around the league, but Michael Delzato, his... Um, advanced stats, Corsi for, Corsi against are just out of this world on Philadelphia. Not so much this season, but the last season and a half. Um, he's been playing top minutes for them against top talent and his numbers. He just comes out on top every single time. Um, he's co- going to be a UFA this offseason. And while Philadelphia probably has the money to do it, they have a lot of up and coming young defensemen they're going to have to pay eventually. So I don't think they'll resign him. But he's an he's also another option. I think we should look at in the off season for defense. It'll be interesting, and that is the move that I think if you are a Sabres fan, it's cliche. But yeah, we need top four defensemen. <laughs> we need a couple of top four defensemen at this point <laughs> yeah. because the guys we have maybe two right now. So if you're Tim Murray, do you think you're looking to make trades to get guys out, or to bring a couple of guys in to help make a push, like? Maybe a couple of defensemen, like you want to go look at maybe, for example, maybe like Colorado's roster and maybe try to pick off Fedor, Fedor Tutin for a cheap weekend for like a, you know, a late pick or even Patrick Rukash. You know, they're minus 22, minus 19, each of them, but they're playing Colorado. Yeah, I'm not worried they about can't plus minus. They can't be worse Josh George's or Kulikov or Bogosian this year. George's, Franzen, Bogosian, much. they've all been just, they have not performed to the level that they needed to this season. I mean, if, I, if I'm tomorrow, I'm out there l- looking for a UFA for, uh, next year. Yeah. An older defenseman. I, just trying to like, dump a couple late round picks. Carl Walsner, one name I'm looking at. For, he's going to want a big deal, but, you know, I, I think that he can go immediately into the, the top four on this team. If you're looking to go a little bit more short term, I think. Johnny Aduya, maybe a guy that you could be interested in. He's 35, but he's not like, you know, Andre Markov is going to be a free agent. Brian Campbell is going to be a free agent. Those guys are almost too old at this I, point. I, I would like to see you could get a Aduya on a two or three year deal, I think, and you should be okay. But like you said, Del Zotto is also an intriguing. He, he's had a weird career where he's been 
you know, he was the toast of New York for a little while. And now he's, he's been a healthy scratch a couple of times as well in Philadelphia and in Nashville. So he's, he's been kind of all over the map. I definitely like the, uh, Alsner consideration because I think he's the kind of guy you could pair up with Ristolainen and, and just let, let Ristolainen loose offensively. And that just sounds great to me. I think that's why we see him be more successful with Jake McCabe because McCabe can lock that down and, and we see Risto just go off. So that's sort of what I'm looking for in a partner for Risto. So that'd be great. Yeah. And, and it is, it is understanding that you want to kind of match up your guys with someone that, allows them to perform at a high level right in, exactly. in that complementary sort of fashion where you don't i mean obviously it's impossible to forever uh keep styles matched up with each other and and understanding that it certainly would be a nice uh appearance if uh if the sabers could find somebody but i don't know there's still a lot of holes on this team and that's something that you're not going to fix it at the trade online. I think the goal is to decide, are you going all in on this and going to try and make a push for a wild card spot? Or are you pulling the reins back a little bit? You don't want to hurt your team to the point where they don't feel like they could at least have a, a chance at uh, a chance at contending. But it's a really tough situation being on the brink of potentially a playoff spot. I mean, what about Tyler Ennis? That's a guy you can look at. He could probably turn around for a decent defen- decent pick and maybe turn around for a defenseman. Or turn- He's got term left and a bunch of talent. I think that's a guy you can sell to a team for something decent. To me, Tyler Ennis is the guy I'm leaving unprotected in the expansion draft, hoping that Vegas takes him. That's where my plan would head. So hopefully that happens. Um, I-, I don't know if anyone would take on this trade value wise but it, it's an option i think too you gotta look at it in the sense that we've now seen guys like justin bailey and evan rodriguez and we're seeing the speed that they're injecting so i was at the game on saturday against st louis and you see marcus with all due respect to marcus felino and brian gianta which speed has never been a part of their game but you see them lumbering down, and then you see what gets unlocked when guys like Eichel and Reinhardt and Kane are playing with these guys like Bailey and Rodriguez who really are able to keep up with them when it comes to the speed that you need. And that's not to say that, the, of course, there's a spot on this team, I think, for Marcus Felino. If anybody gets moved to me, I think it's Brian Gianta. I understand that he's the captain, but I think that with his role sort of winding down on the team he was the captain through some of the roughest years roughest seasons in franchise history and there's a lot of respect for him for that and i understand that he's a relatively local guy being from rochester but gianta even if it's only for a mid-round pick or something like that gianta is the guy that i'm most interested in getting rid of because of that i don't see a spot for him on this team in the future i think it would just do him justice you know he's near the end of his career if you send him to a cup contender um i think that'd be good for him i'm not sure i think he was quoted to saying that he doesn't want to leave here but that could have just been talked well to media, like, he has you know? to say that I, exactly I, it's, it's um, a bad look if you say oh yeah yeah, yeah. no i'm i'm cool exactly so out? you know i i think it would just be nice for him to get moved to a cup contender and i think you got the value right on for him, maybe a mid-round pick. Um, and I thought he's played pretty decent this season. I'm not the biggest Gianta fan, but he, he scored some points. He's second on the team in even strength points behind Kane. Uh, Gianta was number one up until like two weeks ago when Kane has just taken over here. But um, he's had a nice season for himself, and and, and it's definitely uh, upped his value in the I, trade market. And I think Gianta is actually the guy, whether or not you decide you're in contention or not, is the guy that you get rid of because I don't care if you think you're going to make the playoffs or not. If you're looking to shake it up, if you really want to hand this team over to the next generation and you know give the C to, I'm assuming, Ryan O'Reilly at this point because, good Lord, if you put it on Josh Georges, um, and a, having a real acceptance for moving things into the next phase of the franchise. Not that, not that Gianta is holding them down because, like you said, you know his even strength points have been super productive, and he's he's actually this has been his best season as a saber. 
that all said, I think if you're looking at guys that aren't going to be here in the future, maybe you can reassign him at a lower number uh, for one or two more years coming back out of free agency. But yeah, it, it's uh, I think the time has come for Brian Gionta to head out. I mean, it, who would you rather have? In the, I, I'd rather have Justin Bailey playing in that spot in like the playoffs if of we course. were to get there. So of I course. mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. You're trying to get that experience, trying to really you know push somebody to the next level. Let let some of these guys, let Evan Rodriguez, let Justin Bailey. They've you know in in limited spots have really done a nice job when it came to performing and 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 executing you know much better and looking quite frankly looking more comfortable to me than playing with you know you, you slow down almost when you got to play with a big lumbering guy like a Marcus Felino and he has a totally different role and he's the perfect third line kind of tough guy winger that hopefully nets you 35 to 40 points in any given season I'm totally fine it's not anything against him but yeah, I just think that uh, we're at the point where we need to kind of accept the fact that uh, that they need to move on from them. So, um, looking at some other potential uh, free agents, like we said, we mentioned Delzato. I like Johnny Aduya. Um, is Muzzin a free agent, or is he just been on the trade block? Uh, rumored Jake Muzzin. I think he's just on the trade block right now because they okay. have a lot of defensemen over there. I just wanted to get that cleared up. Michael Stone. Um, Defenseman from Arizona, potentially somebody. A lot of old guys, like we said, Markov, Mark Streit, Dennis Weidman, maybe potentially someone that's interesting. He's only 33. Uh, Chris Pronger is a free agent. Isn't he in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> I think he works for the NHL now. Well, <laughs> technically being in a player still, so it's a weird situation. I love Arizona because they have both. Uh, they have Chris Pronger, and I believe that they also have um, Pavel Datsuk now as well. That's correct. So some real legends there uh, <laughs> playing playing the string out in the desert or in Russia. Um, yeah, what are you thinking? I was trying to remember the uh, the rules for the expected draft and how many you got to So it's either 7-3-1 seven, seven, one, or 8-1. One. So I, I, I found a capfriendly.com. Okay. Mm-hmm. I protected O'Reilly, Akposo, Evander Kane. Felino, Gergen, uh, Zemgis, Larson, and Kyrier. And left exposed Molson, Annis, Gianta, Delorier, Kayla Riley, Grant, Justin Kia, Cole Schneider, and Kaganet. So a lot of, the, I mean, a couple of those guys are unrestricted yeah, anyway, so they'll be gone. But yeah, it is interesting to think. A lot of people are like, oh, let's, uh, you know, thinking that Matt Molson is going to be someone that's going to be immediately snatched up. Well, the only way I could really see Matt Molson being picked is if they're in trouble of not hitting the salary floor in Las Vegas and just feel this overwhelming urge to um, get a fourth line winger for five million dollars a year for the next three. This is year three of the contract, I believe. Yeah, I think that's we have two right. more years of this. Um, Matt Molson has done better than I think any of us have expected. But, you know, it'll be interesting to uh, to see what comes of uh, uh, with them. Um, but that's, an, you know, Tyler Ennis is the interesting one, too, I think. W- what do you, you know, besides the sauce, which we tried to get. Did you hear about the sauce, by the way? I heard about the sauce. Still can't find the sauce. Did you hear why the sauce was recalled? No, it was recalled. The seal wasn't properly uh-huh. sealed onto the... <laughs> Under the jar, apparently. I so thought they stole the recipe. Of there were reports. The I world. thought that Lindy Ruff's tie just went to every single store in the greater Buffalo area and snatched them all up. <laughs> it was it, just this hot sauce and ranch dressing mixed together. Exactly. That's what it is. It is every is, middle school did ever throughout school. <laughs> it is the greatest commercial of all time. Um, because not only do you have Tyler Ennis in a chef's hat cooking, but you then have Jack Eichel, Ryan O'Reilly, Sam Reinhardt, and of course Marcus Foligno, uh, eating a variety of different goods. Jack Eichel's eating a salad. Like who would put hot sauce and ranch on a salad? I don't know. It sounds like a bad mix to me. But they're just throwing it on pasta. On that guy, he's just got that big <laughs> cauldron in front of him. It's great. Um, if you haven't seen the commercial yet, shame on you. Go see it. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, it's um, he. He's 
what we the the picture that we have of what Tyler Ennis is in our heads isn't what he is on the ice, and it hasn't been that way for two or three years now. But I still think that he's one of the most intriguing players on the roster. So rather than keeping a Will Carrier, would it make more sense to keep Tyler Ennis? I don't know. Salary considerations there. I love Carrier. I don't know. I love Carrier too. I, what what your list you put together there is exactly what I would expose uh, if I were Tim Murray in the expansion draft forward wise. And that's it was why perfectly done. And that's why you can get away with trading Ennis because there's still guys left over that you can expose. I think that that's why they extended Bulk. This is a, a guy they they have to expose and a player. I think that's why they resigned him. And there's, I mean, there's people out there saying that's sort of why we signed Delorier to a two year contract yeah. so we could expose him. Um, so it looks like maybe thought was put into this for a while uh, from Tim Murray, which is good. You want him to do that, so cool. Yeah, I was gonna say I think Tim Murray's still playing a lot of chess while fans are playing checkers when it comes to these moves, and I hope so. It's true, you know, it, you have to um, you have to keep ahead and keep your team ahead of the curve with understanding that it's not always gonna work out for you. I mean, he he's he's sneaky, smart. He makes really good trades. Like, I think he, he's made a lot of really good trades so far. If people want to question the Leonard trade. He's a first-round pick. But Leonard's, um, he's a quality goaltender. I think he can be an NHL starter. He's had a good season so far. He started off, you know, injured with high ankle sprain last year, and that's a tough injury for goalie to deal with. And he looks the part, in my opinion. He's 6'5", he's huge. He can keep his team in games. He's making 40 saves a game most nights. Yeah. And he's not hurting them. Yeah. I'm, and, and it is unfortunate who that first round pick turned out to be for Ottawa. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's the biggest problem is, oh, it's this Hotch, or uh, what's his name? Um, Colin White. Yeah. And he looks like the next great American <laughs> defenseman. Hey, 20 other teams passed on him, right? Yeah. To, to pick him up there. Um, but he looked really impressive. Yeah. Leonard right now is tied for ninth with Craig Anderson in terms of five-on-five save percentage at 925. He is he is one thousandth of a point behind Braden Holtby, and he is uh, tied actually with Craig Anderson and Sergei Bobrovsky and a couple points, uh, one thousandth of a point ahead of Matt Murray. I, pretty good company, I would argue. Yeah, I don't have a single problem with Leonard right now. Um if anyone out there still does, yeah, I think you're crazy right now. He does occasionally let in the, the bad goal, like you said earlier, but he's just been solid. Stopping the 40 shots a game, um, which we lead the league, I think, after the new year in shots allowed per game now. Only Frederick Anderson in Toronto has made more saves as a raw stat. Anderson has 1,375 Leonard has 1277, and that is, oh, sorry, Cam Talbot also has, uh, he has over 1400 saves. So, third, um, yeah, he's ahead of everybody else, ahead of Dubnik, ahead of Bobrovsky, um, he, Schneider. He's faced a lot of shots behind a porous defense that we've talked about. So, he's doing a really nice job of, of bailing him out. And, you know, part of it, too, is how good of a job Anders Nielsen's done as well. I mean, the team has performed really well in terms of goalie. And now I liked the fact that they went with Leonard for these three games and four nights. They said, hey, you're a number one guy. And he looked a little bit tired and he was playing, you know, one of the best offenses in Chicago. But how can you be upset with his performances against Colorado and St. Louis? It was, was it annoying to see the shorthanded, goal against St. Louis, you betcha. It was really frustrating, but he got completely left out to dry there. But the power play, not even... I think it was Franzen that just sort of started lagging through center ice and kind of uh, let Upshaw sneak behind well, him, and well, that what, was the end of it. What happened on that play was it was just right off the faceoff. Akposa went to pass to the point, but their winger jumped the pass, and our defense or that's were what both you're just right. sitting yep, still. Right. And they had no chance of defense, but yeah. Akposa made a poor pass there and off to the races. Yeah, it's, so. just, it's also just a spark deke by a veteran forward. And is it Hartnell that scored that goal, right? Upshaw. Upshaw. The was the uh, same move uh, Baptiste pulled uh yeah, I mean, earlier in the game. Because when you're going against a goalie, it's six for five, and you're coming up with speed and breakaway. 
your best move is to you know open the five hole. Yep. Because it's a long way to go down. Well, we've seen that we have seen that Leonard's five hole is not exactly uh, ironclad this season. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it, you know, we've established who the number one goaltender is in town, and I, that is going to that number is going to keep going up. I think uh, as well as good as Nielsen has been. But um, I, what I'll say before talking about Tim Murray's trade, I feel like Tim Murray, like you said, he's he's playing chess, we're playing checkers. I think he's got he's got things worked out. He's thinking something no one else has, you know, thought of. Like he's fleeced Colorado. People give him crap about this uh, Winnipeg trade, but it's oh, working. oh do they? <laughs> <laughs> it's working out. I mean, when Bogle was on his game, Bogle was a pretty great initial defenseman. I don't think he's near healthy. I think it's his problem. But Kane's working out. He I think he makes smart, calculated trades, and I would expect a surprise on Tuesday. I think the Still to this day, it didn't even really amount to um, a whole lot. But in he when he traded, um, I think it was he traded Matt Molson and Cody McCormick to Minnesota and got a couple second round. Pay- I'm looking up the deals right now. So they got um, in that deal, the Sabres received Tory Mitchell and two second round picks. And they traded Matt Molson and Cody McCormick. Um, Molson and McCormick both signed back with Buffalo in the offseason. Tory Mitchell, they eventually flipped for a pick. And I don't remember exactly what happened with the other two picks. But essentially, they gave up nothing but two players for 25 games and ended up getting them all back. Now, the Molson contract has been a mistake. To be able to take two guys from the worst team in the NHL and convince them to sign back, it, you know, it, people I think have a lot of respect for, for Tim Murray. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot to be said about what he has and, and what he's capable of. I think the one trade he might want back would be uh, McNabb or Fashing and Delorier. That, that's one we talk about on the podcast pretty often. Um, I, we, we, talk, we end up talking about Delorier way too much for... My liking, at least. I like Delorier. I think he's fun to watch. He's not great. At, he's not great <laughs> at hockey. Know, fun to but watch. He's entertain, <laughs> he entertains me because he's. I don't know. But I, I mean, for, for for what the Sabers need right now, and what Brandon McNabb is, and we still don't know about Hutchinson Fashion. I think this, I think the Sabers could use McNabb more now than they could use Fashion. Oh, absolutely. Oh God, yes. Sure. I mean, McNabb would absolutely be the number two defenseman on this team, yeah. and. To give up on him so quickly was interesting. Um, I think he said high hopes for Hunter Fashion. Well, I don't think I don't think it was giving up McNabb. I think he was. I think he was fleecing. I think he thought he was tearing apart LA in that trade. Hudson Fashing, he was a fourth round pick originally, and then he became the top level right wing in NCAA hockey at Minnesota. So there was certainly a you know a lot of people like who he is, um, but. He's sort of, you know, he's only 21. I, you know, I'm not comfortable with necessarily saying that a guy's plateaued. No, he didn't really do anything here when it came to his six, what was he up here for? Six games, five yeah, games, six, whatever I it, was. it was. Six, exactly. It wasn't anything, um, you know, too impressive. And again, when you're that young, it, it's, you don't want to give up on somebody, but he has, he's only played. 17 games this year. And I think he's actually, I, I believe he's hurt right now. Uh, he, he's been injured for most of the season, but I believe he has come back in the the last maybe week or two. So it's finally. hard. It, yeah. It, I mean, he's got three goals and one assist. I don't know. I'm not going to scout off of a box score right now, but certainly you would hope that he would have a little bit more production. But don't forget, too, he was he ended up playing three years in Minnesota. Um, he you know played pretty well for the team over there. But McNabb is someone that I, I don't think that, for one reason or another, Murray didn't think that he was going to develop into what he has. And, yeah, that's a that's a big miss, given that you also gave up two second-round picks in that deal as well. And you were taking prospects, and you know, you're going to expose one of them, and the other one still hasn't come to fruition three years later. Four years later now, really. So it happens. They're not all going to be winners, um, but we certainly had some fun with some Jerry Sullivan tweets this weekend. So, 
Oh, God. It's all good. No worries, fam. It's a good tweet, by the way. Thank you. Good tweet. I, well, good. I was just feeling a little bit randy at the game there on Saturday. Shout out to my son for taking that photo. <laughs> he was not aware of the tweet. All I just said was, hey, smile. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally comfortable with exploiting my kids. Good to know. Good to know. So the one game we already talked about is the St. Louis game. We kind of ran into the trades there. and e Banner came through with some topic. <laughs> oh, that happens on our pack podcast all the time, too. Uh, the St. Louis game, I thought, like you said earlier, was one of the better efforts of the se- almost a full 60-minute effort. I think near the end of the second period is well, they didn't look great. I think St. Louis was out shooting them 14-3 at one point. Um but I, I love the effort. Jack looked incredible this game, I think. One of his better games. The pass to Baptiste was phenomenal. Just the entrance in the zone, the way he carries the puck in the zone. He's one of the I think he's one of the best players in the league at doing that. Just controlled breakouts and then just carrying it in the zone. He's solid at that and it was on display in St. Louis or not in St. Louis, but against St. Louis. I just like the way that knowing that this was such an important game, there were a lot of prof- per, uh, impressive performances, and this is a team that blew them out in St. Louis earlier this season, too. So it was nice to see them rebound in such a professional way, and knowing that you, you know, and this was also a St. Louis team, I don't believe that they had lost since Ken Hitchcock was fired. They I think were, they had yeah, they were still undefeated. 6-0 and or something like that, so uh, under Mike Yell, they, Mike Yell, they've, um, they've looked a lot more close to what we remember the St. Louis Blues looking like. So, some said that it was the most important game in the franchise since the Tank of Blues against Arizona. I mean, and it's not that far off of a statement when you think about it. Like, what other individual games can you think of in the past four years that had that much riding on it? Because knowing that you had Chicago coming into town the next night, you knew that you had to get some sort of, you had to get something out of this game, right? They got something out of this game. They got something really nice out of that game. Two points in regulation. Held it together when it looked like things may fall apart. So and they had two guys playing, like two young guys playing big roles and Rodriguez and, and, uh, and Baptiste and, and ba- Bailey. Baptiste played, what, like 10 hours before in Rochester. You played the night before and it was an afternoon Yeah, game. the uh, <laughs> Samson Reinhardt uh, illness. Yeah. was uh, kind of came out of nowhere. And, yeah, like they said on the pregame, you know, that that guy's not going – he's not waking up thinking – it's very possible that he woke up being told, get your ass to Buffalo, you're <laughs> playing in three hours or whatever it may be, right? Um, again, yeah. one of the great advantages of having a professional uh, – your uh, minor league team an hour down the road. Um, but, yeah, man, I there's a lot to like uh, with these young guys, with – Bailey and Baptiste and Rodriguez and, you know, God willing, someday Gooley and Fashing. And the cupboard is not entirely bare when it comes to the prospects uh, department here because there's a lot of young guys that are going to end up making a lot of other guys more um, more expendable. And you got to constantly turn over your, your roster in the NHL or you're going to risk, you know, being stuck. You, you can't have everything with a hard salary cap like they have here. So, sort of like the, uh, these kids to come uh, up. the Chicago method, you know, you pay your top guys and then the, everyone else is sort of just a rotating door of, of guys. I mean, that's what you have to do. I mean, half of the then Thrashers, now Jets, and uh, was the last season that they were in Atlanta were cast offs from Chicago's team that they couldn't afford to keep anymore. So they made a big trade and got them all out of there. There's cast offs from Chicago and Columbus and Carolina. Yep. They're all over the place. Yeah, there's spread Johnny Apple seeds of <laughs> cast offs from championship teams. Uh, it's it is something. And you know, not every obviously not everybody can do it, but if it's a, a model that you can follow and, and somehow figure out, then ultimately it's probably the most successful way to build a winner consistently. Turn it over. It's amazing how they can afford to pay Taves and Kane twelve mil per season. And they figured out pay Keith Seabrook and Hosa too. Keith has maybe the best contract in the NHL for a team. What's he making? I don't even is he if he's making like I don't even think he makes five and a half million think, a year. I think he makes five. It's some ridiculously team friendly deal that he's signed through like two thousand twenty two or something like that. 
I think they have Crawford though at like six or seven mil then too. That one's a little. It's a true stars and scr- <laughs> but it's a stars and Crub- scrubs team. You know they also have Panarin on a rookie deal. I mean that doesn't hurt either to be able to find a guy that's arguably a top thirty wing in the league, it, it, probably higher than that, uh, and, and make him work. I mean it's there's a lot to like when you're in Chicago and the breaks keep finding you when you're successful like that. They have know? the uh, the leading score in the OHL is. A prospect of Chicago, Alex DeBrincat, and they're just going to re- keep retooling and it's probably going to be successful for years to come in Chicago. Just I just saw you had Nick Deloria's Wikipedia page up, and it <laughs> looked like it was about four sentences on it. I just wanted to be sure that he was included in that nav trade before I said it. Oh, he for was. sure, yeah. That's why, uh, folks, nothing but fact checking over here. Very, <laughs> very, <laughs> very small Wikipedia. It's page. a very it's yeah. called, what we call a stub in the Wikipedia world. <laughs> <laughs> so, Not see, so here the Sabers are. You know, they're four points out of the playoff spot in terms of the wild card and four points out of third place in the uh, division. And it's not, you know, you, you say you're, people say they're sitting there helpless now for a week. They can't do anything to reposition themselves and can only falter here. But Bob Ryan out four to six weeks. That's a pretty big piece in Ottawa. Mitch Marner hitting like a 10 day IR in Toronto. That's a. That can help. So, I mean, there's not... There's things that are there helping oh, the Sabres here. There's some stuff. What you do, if you're a Sabres fan right now, is you root like hell for the uh, for the Western Conference because you got Winnipeg playing... You know, just we're recording on Tuesday. Edmonton and Tampa. Winnipeg and Toronto. Um, tomorrow, Edmonton is playing Florida. Boston is playing at Anaheim again. Uh, Thursday, Calgary at Tampa. You know, you, you got to keep it. Boston is in uh, Los Angeles. Friday, Edmonton is in Washington, which doesn't really affect, but Calgary is in Florida. Auto, you know, um, just keep rooting for these teams, and then eventually you're going to be able to catch up here, and hopefully some of these teams have lost points, and or you keep rooting for teams like Washington and Pittsburgh to just keep sucking up points and taking them away from it. Really, at this point, that four-headed monster in the Metropolitan Division of Pittsburgh, Washington, Columbus, and the Rangers that are so far ahead, basically, of everybody else, including the Atlantic Division, um, you know, basically absent Montreal. Just keep having these points not fall to the teams. That's all you can do right now. Another another reason to keep your glass half full, I think, is just look at the schedule when we return. We play Colorado, Arizona, Colorado, Nashville, um, and Man, we should get those wins. We'll see how the the first game back goes because I don't think a team has won yet on their uh, first game back. I believe that's correct. But I, we play Colorado. Some teams may have gotten points out of it, but yeah. yeah, I think you're right that nobody's gotten the full two. Hopefully, we can get that two points because it's against Colorado. And then you look further down the line. We play Toronto twice still. And if you thought that St. Louis game was big, these two games have the potential to be huge. Um, I, and I hope they are because we'll be in good standing by then. Can you picture the by the way, and Ottawa beat New Jersey tonight, which at this point is a good thing for um, Buffalo. Can you imagine uh, Sabres Twitter if they lose that first game to Colorado? Oh, my God. And it's like <laughs> four to one or something. You know, I'm not saying that's what I want it to be. I'm just I'm just telling everybody that you may not want to go on Twitter.com that night. You know where, where me and you work well as a Twitter team is I avoid Twitter at times like that and you relish I it. I embrace it. <laughs> Yeah, we actually we do have a good yin and yang when it comes to con- the content, the hot internet content that we provide on our on it our works. Twitter airwaves. Um, yeah, I to me, you just root for the points to stay out of the. And this is really dumb and really stupid, but Winnipeg is leading Toronto after two periods, four to three, which is good <laughs> for what it's worth. Nobody's going to hear this and. Everybody will know the score by the end of the game, but or by the time this podcast is posted. But those are the kind of games that you got to root for uh, at this point. And today, uh, Tuesday night is the busiest night of uh, of the Sabers bye week. So they have until I don't believe they work out again until is it Thursday or Friday? The Sabers, yeah, they actually have off until the day before. They can't practice they until can't the pra- day before. So they'll practice, I assume, here and then fly out to Colorado Friday Ooh, night. That's my guess. Yeah, it sounds right. Um, and then that little mountain, the two mountain division American teams, and uh, 
Colorado and Arizona, and then you're back home against Nashville. So this just continuing to play the Western Conference as it has been pretty much all month. The Bivik is great too. I mean, the Sabers need like it helps them get healthy. Like let Kulikov literally rest for a yeah. week. Let Bogo, you know, get better. Right. And us too. And these guys cannot hit the ice under team control for four days. Yep. It's not to say that some of them aren't over in North Town Center right now, just yeah. skating around on a even, rink or whatever. But even Gergensen's and Carrier can get healthy. Everybody, just everyone get healthy. Even Jack's ankle, which I still, I think, is still getting better. You can see him visibly faster yeah. now than he, he was two weeks ago. Yeah, the last two weeks he's just looked dynamite on his skates. Um, it would I mean, be nice to actually have healthy scratches. Yeah. Like a full <laughs> full complement of healthy scratches, Nick DeLore. Um <laughs> And just to, you know, it, it, because right now the decisions are being made for everybody else, right? It is, it is fascinating to see, but it's exciting. I feel like we're sort of in a spot where we could maybe, you know, talk about a playoff run here. I think th- they're, just, run. they're just outside of it. I mean... Boston is one small injury away from, you know, losing ground. Patrice Bergeron takes a shot in the hand. You know, he's out for three weeks, and there goes at least three games for them easily. Yeah, yeah. It's not like none of these teams, man. You go through the Eastern Conference, like I said, and especially the Atlantic Division. Ottawa and Montreal are leading the division right now, 70 points. Montreal's falling apart, too, as we speak. They Which is one of their best goal scorers. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, the coaching change and everything, like, it is painfully obvious. Like I said, Washington, Pittsburgh, Columbus, and the Rangers, 85, 80, 79, 77. Those are the point totals. Best in the Atlantic is Ottawa and Montreal with 70, man. It, the best teams play outside your division. Why not? Why not the Sabres for one time? Just to get get in that wild card race, you owe it to the fan base, I think, after asking them to go through one of the most... Ex- I mean, outside of Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA, has any fan base had to endure a longer tank, an intentional tank period? Sacramento Kings fans, much the Browns. Priorities. The Browns might be going through it right now. They even They're had a 10-win one season in there. I, yeah, I <laughs> point is, is like... I think you just got to try and make a run. And I, I know it may not be part of the master plan, but I think it's okay in this case to, I hope to our division, have a slight detour. I hope our division stays this week next season because I could see us near the top of that if things go right in the off season. And what's most fun about this is how, how the entire division could totally flip-flop in a matter of two weeks. 12, like, 12 points between Ottawa, Montreal, and Like if Carey Price Detroit. gets a bad stomach flu, there goes Montreal. You know what I mean? If Stamkos actually comes back, Tampa's going to shoot right back up. You could easily see Toronto, Philly, Buffalo, Tampa up, you know, the top three or four. And Tampa's in seventh in this division right now. It is unbelievable. And then you got the surging Doug Wade, New York Islanders, who, like, Doug Wade has reinvigorated them. Islanders were by far the worst team in the East for half the season. And now they're just uh, 64 points or two points out of a playoff spot. It's crazy. It is. I mean, but that's nobody is out of it. I don't know how, you know, because and because Detroit has the streak going, and I think they have to make an earnest effort to try and keep that streak alive as hokey as it may be. I think they have to keep it. I don't know. I definitely think. New Jersey and Carolina and Philadelphia and Detroit should be sellers, but I don't know if they're going to be because they're so close to a playoff spot. Philadelphia had a 10 game winning streak this season and now they have 63 points. Like it, it really has been just a, a crazy season when it comes to the Eastern conference. And then you don't have any of the dregs like you do in the Western conference, you know, 35 points for Colorado, 49 for Arizona and, it's not like Vancouver or Dallas are really anything impressive either. Um, the, you know, the power lies in one division in the entire league, and you're not in it. So go ahead, try and make a run. You good? I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I I figured that was a natural pause. And I thought you were all going to applaud that point, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so I, maybe we should discuss... Uh, Potentially, what we're doing next week. Yeah, next week we're yeah. doing a show at Lockhouse in the future. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, which is after. March first. Because I think you and Jeff both go into the game Tuesday. 
That is a valid point. We will be uh, for Nashville. So we will be at Lockhouse. We will discuss the Colorado game, the Arizona game, the Nashville game, and whatever does or does not happen in the trade deadline, which will be on that Tuesday before. So I got a question for you guys. Yeah. Randomly while we're still talking here. Sure. Do you think the Sabres neglect Rochester? How so? I see a lot of people on Twitter saying that the Sabres neglect Rochester. Here's one tweet, for example. Every time Amherst play in Buffalo, I wonder when the Sabres ownership will care more about the AHL community they're wasting in Rochester. Do you mean like roster wise? Like I what have no you... idea. I don't. Know if, I don't know if people talk about when they mean I'll, it. When I'll, they say I'll it. answer it. Um, assuming they're talking about roster wise, I guess. Um, I, I think injuries sort of have a lot to do with that because Rochester, I think, is one point from the basement in the AHL. If we didn't have these injuries, you know, Falk and Fadoon would be down there. Baptiste, Bailey, uh, Rodriguez wouldn't be up here. So roster-wise, I think injuries has a lot to uh, has a lot to do with the so-called neglect. Other than that, I have no idea what they could be talking about. I see it often. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know, you <laughs> That's guys weird. Don't, um, yeah, real quick, the uh, the Amherst have 44 points, which puts them. Uh, yeah, only Hartford and Stockton have less. Now, I believe also that the Pacific Division plays less games in the AHL than everybody else. Is that correct? Uh, I think because they have the five California teams plus the two Texas and one Arizona team. It, it's a little bit hard to say. But, yeah, I mean, right now in the North Division, the Amherst are 44 points through 52 games, and that is... Uh, well behind sixth place, which is currently Binghamton, has 53 games played and 49 points. So, the as far you know, growing up in Rochester um, and knowing that the what the mentality is, I, I you know, it's it really sucks to hear this um, when you're a fan of that team, and that's a really proud franchise, and they've been around since the 50s, and outside of the brief ownership issues that they had when essentially they had a uh, tax sheet owning the team. Um, the relationship with Buffalo has been strong. I mean, they're playing here tomorrow night. I haven't really seen much promotion from the team, from the Sabres on their part, other than I did get a letter saying that if I wasn't going to use the tickets, I should send them back. Huh. Uh, <laughs> I swear that's honestly what I got sent. Did not send them back. Probably will not be going. Um, but yeah, I, I, you're, you are part of feeding the franchise above you and it sucks, but that's, that's ultimately what your goal is. You're kind of catering to the whims and the needs of the NHL franchise. So the fact that the Amherst haven't been anything super impressive recently, you know, I don't think that really... I don't think that really matters to to Sabres ownership at this point. Just a random question. Why did you guys no, it's fair. I it, I'm I, I'm more concerned. You know, I and I'm looking at this roster, and I'm sure that Bobby Shea and Mac Bennett and Kyle Bonus and Cole Schneider are really nice people. But I'm way more concerned about what guys like Nick Baptiste and Evan Rodriguez and Alexander Nylander and. I, those are the guys I'm concerned about. I just want to see them progress and then eventually get to Buffalo. Quick fact here. Uh, Jeff actually went to the same high school as Cole Schneider. They both went to St. Joe's, so I'm sort of rooting for Cole Schneider to become something. It'd well, be there fun. you go. There gives you a reason. Yeah, He is from Williamsville, so you know that that matters around here. <laughs> um, Tim Kennedy's on the Amherst. Did you know that? I forgot all about that. I remember Tim Kennedy. He was, yeah, he was signed by Carolina or picked up off waivers by Carolina when we were going to claim him for Rochester, and they were nice enough to loan us Tim Kennedy to, Kennedy to play in the HL. Well, there you go. So but Tyson's tracking's down there too, huh? Yeah, yep. Hudson Fashing, as we I mean, talked about earlier. I mean, there's some guys. Tyson's tracking wasn't half bad when he was up here. Would you rather have him or Corey Franzen on the team? I don't know. Well, didn't. Um, who and was it Casey Nelson that got picked up by Nashville and then they released him and that then was we, Grant. Oh, that was Derek Grant. Grant yep. That's right. Um, yeah. I don't really care about Rochester. Sorry, 
No, yeah, exactly. I mean, I care. I re, you know, I I care about the individual teams, and I don't necessarily think winning or losing is ultimately the goal of any sort of minor league team. I think ultimately your goal is to feed the the big team. And yeah, I, I think there's really no correlation in like the AHL team not winning and then the big league team not winning as well. I think it doesn't have to be like that. I don't think there's any correlation there. That's all I got, man. So we will be back next week. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, pinch hitting here tonight, sir. Oh, no problem. Do you mind if I plug the podcast? Yeah, go again? right ahead. All right, cool. Like I said, I'm Scott Escobar. Well, actually, Justin said that earlier. He, he did. He asked if he wanted my last name on here, and there it is. Uh, anyways, you can listen to my podcast, TS Hockey Podcast, Top Shelf for Mama Hides a Podcast, on iTunes or Google Play, or you can visit our website, tshockeypodcast.com. You can listen on there. It takes a second to load up, but it works, I assure you. And then you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, also at TS Hockey Podcast. Make sure you get those uh, iTunes subscriptions up there for and you guys as well. And you can listen to us on the 716 Sports Network, which starts up again next Monday. Yep. This is a there you point. go. Monday. <laughs> Brief hiatus for the network. But. So thank you to our sponsors, Lockhouse, Distillery, and Bar. We'll see you next Wednesday at Lockhouse. Yeah. And uh, Fanduzzi.com. We record here in the Fanduzzi.com studios. Scored sports debate with the pros. Some pretty cool pros on there. Use promo code 716 if you would decide to join. And uh, that's all I got. We'll see you next week, next Wednesday. Thanks for doing Share with your friends. Share with your family. Because we're pretty cool. Yeah. We like you guys. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Bye.